Hello, everybody. Welcome to this workshop. My name's Ted Dale. I'm a professional game coach developer. Been with the FA for some time now. In fact, this is uh, an anniversary for me, July. I joined in July 2013. I'm joined today by two colleagues, Warren Hackett and Kelsey Byrne. And in the background, we have uh, Matty Robottom working on the, the tech stuff with Matt Bishop uh, supervising and overseeing in the background as well. I'm going to ask Kelsey and Warren just to briefly introduce themselves. Kelsey, if you'd like to go first. Yeah, um, obviously Kelsey Byrne, Women's National Coach Developer. Um, my current region is North West and West Midlands and uh, a little bit of both between working on qualifications such as the air licence and just working with coaches developmentally in between qualifications as well. And Warren? Uh, yeah, so hi all, uh, Warren Hackett, currently at FAYCD working in the South East. So I've got five clubs that I uh, look after, the coaches within the academy. Uh, former professional football player, uh, former coach within the league as well. So uh, yeah, really looking forward to the webinar and uh, sharing my views. Thank you guys. Um, we're going to look today at the high press and in particular the role of the 7, 9 and 11. And those numbers are sort of generic numbers that we, we use in part of coach speak, I suppose. And, and as as the workshop unfolds, it will be quite, come quite obvious why we refer to those numbers. We appreciate the fact that individually players are numbered very differently. But um, for the purpose of the workshop, we, the two wide players are 7 and 11, and the central forward is uh, the number 9. So we're going to kick things off uh with some comments around what does a high press mean to us? Could I come to you first, Warren? Yeah, no problem, Ted. So just a, just a short description, a definition of what I believe a high press is. So setting out my team um, to go and win the ball back in the opposition's defensive third, uh, setting traps, working off of triggers, uh, and ultimately really looking to win the ball as high as possible uh, and nearest to their goal so that we could potentially hurt them. Would you ever look at pressing high, Warren, uh, to stop a, stick, a team starting as opposed to trying to win the ball back? 100%. I just think with the new um, the new game change, Ted, it's quite difficult to stop them from starting in respect of their two centre-backs are able to come very narrow into the box. And if I commit bodies, potentially they could go into second lines you know, quite easily. So, you know, a little bit, little bit more conscious than I used to be um, to be able to stop them from starting. Okay, thanks for that. Kelsey, what about yourself? What does it mean to you? Um, I think kind of building on what Warren said, really, um, so starting to think about what does it mean in different moments of the game. So whether that's a predetermined strategy and game plan that we're going after or whether that's just a, an in-the-moment perception of we can win the ball back or we've seen something which is allowing us to move forward and step into that into that territory of, of the opposition's um, defensive third. So... If we look really, there's, there's a number of different ways that we could potentially high press, whether that's from a structured start of, of the goal kick or whether that would be a throw in, which is a natural time for us to step on and, and press a little bit higher, or whether that's a turnover of possession, um, or whether that's our primary strategy in open play. So there's, there's probably a number of, of things to consider of what would a high press look like to us in, in each of those different moments. and whether that's a primary strategy that we wanted to use or whether that's just something that we've seen a trigger within the game and, and we're going to go win the ball back um, because there's an opportunity to do so. Great. Thanks for that. It's, uh, I'm, I'm particularly interested in how uh, coaches, clubs, etc., would would put this on the curriculum. You know, there's this belief that if you want a child to do something when they're an adult, then they need to be doing it as a child, but it looks very different to, to as you know in child form as it does in adult form so and I, I've got a particular interest in looking at how uh, clubs and coaches would develop this from foundation phase upwards but making it still you know child friendly so to speak it's, it, we know it's got to be fun we know it's got to focus on fundamentals and, and, and basics um, but I, I would look at it and say for me the simplicity would be could we have a strong side, weak side when we lose possession? By that, by that I mean a, a line drawn from goal to goal, and just get players to understand that whichever side of that line the ball is, can we can we have a stronger presence on that line 
uh, and a weaker presence across the other side. So, for example, you might want to split your team. If you're playing 7v7, you could split 5 and 2 uh, with the goalkeeper included in the 5. So, 5 players would be on the same side as the ball. Uh, 2 players would be on the other side with two purposes. One, to be ready to, to jump on any switch of play from the opposition. And two, to provide a switch of play opportunity should our team win the ball from, from the subsequent uh, pressing example that we would try to get them to to get involved in. So that, that, that that's particularly interesting to me, and and, and maybe later on in the in, in the uh, workshop we can throw some ideas around uh, around that. We're going to have a look at a video uh, and and see how high pressing relates to uh, the the England DNA's version of the out of possession principles of play. So if we can see that now, thank you. So we saw some good evidence there of the press in action uh, across a variety of different games. Um, what particularly do you see, Warren, uh, uh, that the challenges the game presents are for players that, or, and teams, particularly coaches, teams, that want to use this tactic, this strategy as part of their game plan? I mean, I just think that certainly from from my point of view in my mind i'd want to use it as i said to win the ball back as high as possible in the opposition's half it's nearest to their goal and potentially an opportunity to score so although it's a defensive tactic i'd still see it as a quite an offensive one as well um but ultimately you know you need the right players to play in those positions to be able to perform it i think it's really interesting there's lots of evidence lately where teams have a desire to want to play from the goalkeeper and build from the back. And yet the opposition almost uh, are licking their lips saying, thanks for doing this for us because we're going to come after you and try and win the ball back in this part of the pitch. And, and you've you've sort of contributed to that effort by starting your attack in that part of the pitch. So sometimes it, it it's a bit contradictory. It's a bit like a boxer sticking their chin out and saying, if you punch me on the chin, see whether I can take a punch or not. Um, Kelsey, what about yourself? Uh, and in particular, I know you want to talk about um, how how the new rules of the game have impacted on, on this strategy. Yeah, like you said, Ted, um, it, it's quite a trend at the moment. It especially has been within the women's game um, for various reasons. Um, and although that we we are getting better at being able to play over longer distances and goalkeepers getting a lot more consistent with doing that, playing out from the back is still um, a trend that we see from 
from the RTC system through to academies and, and through to first teams. So usually, you know, teams desire to try and create numerical overloads and at least get one more passing option than the total number of players pressing. So the, the new rules actually allowing the, the centre-backs or the goalkeepers in the box to have an advantage where the ball can be moving, they can be studying and assessing what's happening, the movements beyond the press, um, which almost gives the the team's building a little bit of an advantage um, at this moment in time. Like we said, like Warren alluded to earlier, you, you can't now stop teams starting. So you've almost got to be really clever in assessing the risk that's in front but also behind and the space that you're leaving. Um, and I think now that there's been more and more teams stepping on, there's been larger gaps between midfield and the back line because they've, they've been disjointed at times. So it's, it's assessing really, especially from the 9, 7, 11, the risks in front and behind. Um, and also, how, how far are you prepared to go? So we're seeing teams now dropping the full-backs in down the 18-yard box, four and eight sometimes ending up on the edge of the 18 to come in and, and almost wanting you to do that. Um, so it's that anticipated action of what we think is going to happen based on what we've seen of the game prior or what we've looked at the opposition as an, as an analysis perspective, but then trying to work in real time around what is actually happening and where are they hurting us. Um, and, and like we said, like who's in control of this? Because I think at times we could actually control where we would like the ball to be and, and almost force that, but also so can they. So if, if they're dropping more and more numbers in, it might be because they want us to be in that area. They want to suck us in further to hurt us somewhere else. So it's the cat and mouse of trying to work out where's the risk, where are they currently hurting us and how far are we prepared to go with our plays to, to try and win the ball back or at least affect it in some way. I think you made a great point there about control of the game. Uh, and, and we saw yesterday in a high-profile game that that the team that won it only had 29 to 30 percent of possession, uh, but still won the game reasonably comfortably. Um, although, you know, it's still a challenge for for teams to do that. And I think a point we need to make here, and I'm sure you both agree with me, is that going after the high press is is not something random. It's a highly structured, organised process. Um, Warren, your experience with when you work with the national teams, how, to what degree was was that uh, an orchestrated, structured strategy? I mean, as I said, I mean the biggest the biggest thing really, Ted, is that I think the first thing you look at when you're talking about challenges of your seven, nine, eleven, certainly as, as a team when they're pressing, is the opposition's formation. Um, I mean, in international football, you know, you come up against various opposition playing 4-4-2, 4-3-3, 3-4-3, 3-5-2. So in general, you know, we had a, you know, we had a, um, a setup in respect of we played a 4-3-3 and we want to show outside all over the pitch. So again, against a 4-4-2, against a 4-3-3, that's possible. We can do that. Um, and it will simply mean that the 7-9-11 would be prepared um, to work to win the ball back as high as possible. Um, and so, so sorry, the seven, ten, and eleven, uh, or sorry, the seven, nine, um, and obviously then the ten coming into it as well. So one of the wingers might be withdrawn. Um, so ultimately, your seven or eleven could drop either side. So that would be the initial press. But then again, you know, there's other things like you know you're playing against their personnel and their left-sided centre back might be right-footed. So again, that might slightly adjust your press. So that could be a challenge. Your opposition style of play, they might miss the first line and hit into the second line. So that could adjust your press. The score line could adjust your press. So there's loads of different challenges. I think the biggest the biggest thing for me from my learnings is that when we played against a 3-5-2, as I said, essentially we'd always show outside. We had to adjust our setup because of that. Because if we showed outside, we'd be potentially passing, allowing their um, wing backs to be able to receive the ball unopposed and our fullbacks potentially having to jump. So, you know, we we decided that the 7 and 11 would actually show inside uh, and curve their run to force the play inside. So with that, it's very essential that behind the ball that our uh, midfield three, so our, our 8, 4 and 10, would be in split positions. Um, so ultimately, the wider ones of the three could jump on their wing backs. But with that, again, with that setup, you have to make sure that you're, you're back four on their front foot, uh, ready to win anything in front. So, you know... In respect of challenges, as I said, you've got to be very, very um, adaptable. The players have got to be adaptable and they've got to be very good decision makers uh, in respect to the high press. 
sure so so that, that business about uh in or out showing in showing out uh, is something i was gonna gonna raise anyway but you've, you've brought it up uh thankfully for that and you you're talking about adaptability so that whilst you have a preference to show out um you think your players certainly at national level anyway were more than capable of adapting on the fly so to speak within the game if need be um to alter that and, and how would that domino through the team how would that ripple ripple back uh, uh, and impact other players so if the first engager was was showing inside as opposed to the team's preference to show outside would would the would the team be capable of 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 adapting to that i would say so ted i mean it's, it's it's essential that when you're in the game in that moment that you read the game and 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 obviously try and read triggers um, and as i said if the center if your number nine's going in to press the left sided center back who's right footed then it's important that the players behind obviously are reading those those triggers and obviously are looking at that plan thinking well He's going to, you know, he's going to potentially come back inside. This is a great opportunity to not press in isolation, press as a unit, press together for us to go and win the ball back. Yeah, and Kelsey brought up the the, the situation that, that occurs now because of you know, the impact of the new rules. And what we often see now is a front three quite narrow. And, and in later examples in the workshop, we're going to see exactly that. And, and midfield players, uh, I suppose the common phrase these days is jumping on the fullback. Um, and because of the angle of approach they're coming from, uh, whilst they can probably stop the ball, the ball going forward, getting getting players inside might, might be more challenging. Um, and certainly if a front player is coming from an inside position, then the press is going to force outside more, more often than not. So again, you have a team preference, but you, like you're saying, I think the importance of the players being adaptable is absolutely key. And that brings us to the, to, to the next piece around what attributes the players need to have uh, in order to overcome these challenges. Uh, and um, although we may have touched on one or two things there, could you, could you give us a little bit more insight, Kelsey, around how you see this? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think quite obviously as coaches, we jump to the tech and tack quite quickly. Um, and for me, the physical element of this is, is absolutely huge, especially for the high press. So you're talking about players that are doing repeated sprints um, over short distances or over large distances, depending on what the trap looks like or depending on if the opposition beat the trap. So talking about X cells and D cells and, and breaking strength, the amount of times we see players, especially in the female game um, and its infancy of, of professionalism, that hamstrings and, and sort of the coordination of that with the triggers and, and the strength of doing so, a lot of players overran. So they'd run at the ball, overrun, a touch from, from the player in possession, then takes them takes that player out and then all of a sudden the, the, the press is broke already. So I think the repeated sprint definitely um, with the XL and D-cell and, and that breaking that break in strength um, to, to stop and be able to read the triggers and be able to stop in time once running at pace is, is absolutely key. Um, and, and the variation of distances covered, I think, um, we almost see a quite a lot in terms of practice design, presses in small boxes, small areas, two players running out, and it's over really short distances. But what happens if, like Warren says, the, the context of the game changes and we the, the primary strategy was to high press, but it's not anymore? Um, so what does that look like? You know, being able to sustain a high press for 90 minutes is hard work. So what about when we need to drop in? The physicality of those runs, recovery runs, um, runs back to um, sort of backtrack and back press, um, all become larger if the trap's broken. So when we look at Reading in particular in the women's game, who are extremely successful at this, they try and get all bodies into two or three lanes and really, really condense the pitch. But that means when the press is broke, there's some large distances to cover. Um so I think the physical aspects of players and really understanding the physical attributes our players have and what they actually do need in order to be able to to utilise the high press um, and to be able to carry out sort of the strategies in which you wanted to do really, I think was is probably one of the biggest ones for me. Sure. Um, and just as a, as an add on to the physical, one of the one of the big things that especially in the pathway, the lionesses pathway, we speak about is body and limbs. 
and we speak about the player's ability to be able to use their body and limbs to derail or at least to be able to utilize that to get across players to utilize the body effectively and efficiently to win the ball back um, especially when it's a 1v1 dual moving um, which is probably the full back and wide player type of, of press so the body and limbs as another physicality for me is, is probably um, another really key one for this Great, thanks for that. Uh, Warren, you, you mentioned that adaptability, uh, adapting to certain situations. And, uh, you know, I mentioned, uh, make, you know, making changes on the fly in accordance with what's going on. Do, do you want to just enlarge a little bit more around that? I know, I know you've got something to say about the player's ability to decision make in the moment. Yeah, I think, Ted, I mean, I mean, adaptability is huge. Um, the desire to win the ball back is equally as huge. Um, so in respect of adaptability, I mean, one of the key things with the national teams is that all recovery runs are sprints. So initially they could go in, they could make a poor decision uh, when they're going to press. And then they've been able to, you know, to adapt and then recover back very quickly um, and have the desire to recover back very quickly, back into shape to win the ball back. Um, so I think that's not, a nat not necessarily a, a natural thing that you'd expect from a winger, but certainly within the England teams, that's, you know, it's essential that they do that and they're able to, to recover back. I think... Uh... I think the way you you both talk there brings us nicely to um, this slide and, and and the impact of, of the four corner model there. And you've mentioned in, in quite detail, pretty much uh, certainly around the physical aspects and the psych aspects. I just wanted to add in there something from personal experience. Uh, this would have been over twenty years ago now, when um, the impact of of overseas. Uh, strategies and and theories and uh, desires kicked in and the challenge for I'm going to say British based players certainly at the club I was at where they knew that physically they didn't have the capability to to perform at the level required so there was a choice do they commit to a program of preparation and development that would enable them to perform on the field to the required levels or I suppose the bottom line was, did they move on and go somewhere else? Uh, and that was a real challenge. So I think it would be fair to say that that, that sits certainly in the, in the green corner for me. Um, and some players decided to give it a go and stayed and got very, very successful careers uh, from that moment onwards, um, whereas others disappeared from the scene um, over time. Quite, I, I think it's quite... Uh, psychologically based that if you know for example if you're the first engager the chances are of you actually winning the ball are probably slim but your impact on the play is absolutely key because everything else falls out of that uh, and your desire to go selfishly after the ball knowing full well that it's unlikely that you're going to be the one that wins it back but but because of your actions it could be one elsewhere on the field and and, and that's um I suppose that common phrase is is, is referred to as setting the traps. Mm. Did, did, how did you um, how did the national teams go about doing that, Warren? Well, again, I mean, you mentioned about your number nine. I mean, the number nine knows the role that he's playing within the team, um, and psychologically, he knows if he doesn't get that first set up right in respect of it, might he might allow the first path and his body angle and his approach to the ball is not in the right way. He knows that potentially we could get passed around. So although he knows he potentially has got no chance of winning that ball, it's essential that he comes in with the right frame of mind and the right body position with the right distances to be able to go and kind of threaten and, and, and control where that first pass might go. Okay. And Kelsey, you mentioned uh, you mentioned Reading in particular as, as a team that were providing excellent examples of, of going after the high press and, and, and being successful at it. Do, can you just elaborate a little bit more on that for us? Yeah, so Reading are, are really aggressive in their nature, really, and, and they're one of the most successful teams at not only the high press, but also preventing teams from the create phase as well. So their ultimate strategy is to cause panic and to force decisions early and to force mistakes. Um, that's, that's their key strategy. So they're trying to discourage any balls into the centre-backs, um, the first touch is literally a trigger to go. And as you will see from clips that, that we have already seen in, in the principles of play video and we will see later on is that 
They, they continue to press, they press over large distances if they need to. Um, and just looking at the stats in which they score goals, um, they rely quite heavily. If we look at first seven goals within the WS, they rely quite heavily on keeping the ball in that area and forcing mistakes from the opposition. And, and even then, if the ball is turned over in transition, they hope that then the uh, opposition will jump back on the ball quite quickly and cause fouls uh, and mistakes on, on that and that front. So they, they try and cover at least two or three lanes and, and try and really condense the pitch, um, which again, which we alluded to before, does leave some areas to be exploited. Although the, the amount of numbers and bodies in small areas of the pitch makes it very difficult to play out. Um, and therefore they're, they're very successful at that. I suppose what we, we haven't really touched on which is an area in which I suppose Reading are looking at in next would be the transition. So once they have won the ball back, what data suggests is that the goal scoring opportunities they then create from winning it uh, are not as, as high as what they should be. Um, and the goals they score after winning the ball back is not as high as what it should be. So that's where Arsenal women are probably the best at converting the most regains into goal scoring opportunities and that's ultimately what we're there to do is to, to win the ball back but then to try and create an opportunity so it's almost you know what's the what's the plan behind why we're doing a high press what's the what's the strategy and what's the intention is the intention just to stop the momentum of the opposition don't let them build up play don't let them have the time on the ball um, or is it that we want to win the ball back in that area to then force fouls or mistakes, or is it to turn the ball over and create goal scoring opportunities? So I think that that intention of once we've done the high press, what does that now mean? I think is is one to consider. Thanks for that. Uh, some great insight. I'll, I'll ask you both a question here. Do you have any, any evidence of teams selecting when to press and when not to press? Um, what, what, what I'm sort of thinking about here is you've quite rightly uh, highlighted the pair of you that that you know this is energy sapping work that we're talking about so there's got to be some some recovery and some resting going on somewhere although i appreciate they're resting while they're working at the same time but do you have any evidence where teams can say right now we're going now we're going to go and get it or, or do they rely on the uh, the trigger from a, from a, a particular player what about you warren if you went first on this one I'm just, I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to think, Ted, in, in respect of uh, a current sort of Premier League team who might do that. Maybe a someone like a, someone like a Wolves who essentially defend uh, deep more, more time than not. Um, but then again, it could be score dependent that they might go and press higher during a game. I think that would be the your most normal one, um, depending on the score. It could be depending on the weather. Fatigue could have come into a few players, um, so they've been pressing, pressing for you know, 60, 70 minutes and all of a sudden they may go into a mid or a low block. So I think, you know, there's, there's factors that could that could potentially lead to that. Kelsey, anything from you? From my, yeah, from my perspective, Ted, I think when you, I know we, we just alluded to Arsenal a minute ago, but if you look at you sort of Arsenal, Man City, Chelsea, who are in probably the high press top quadrant of data in terms of um, turning the ball over, they do allow more actions per defensive third. So they do allow more. So I think there's more strategic thinking around how many passes, who are we going after? Um, are we going to allow the team in possession a little bit of time? Then we go um, a little bit more thinking behind it, whereas Reading is, is literally more aggressive. First touch, we're setting off um, to, force, to force mistakes and chaos. Whereas I think... The other teams, such as over to Arsenal and Man City, start to think more strategically about when they're going and who they're going after. Okay, okay, thanks. For that. It, it brings us nicely to to uh, talk about particular positions. So, uh, it, it, in our our particular focus at the moment is around the seven, eleven, and, and the nine. If we start, if we start with the nine position, um, I'm going to invite Ke uh, Kelsey just to talk us through how how we layer detail underneath the uh the, the headline so yeah. you can see on the slide here we we we've put two headline um pieces of information on there 
and then we've got some examples of following slides that you're going to talk us through, Kelsey, in terms of the detail below this layer. Yeah, I suppose that this is a, a method in which we use to break down profiling of players and, and what we would like or what we'd expect from players to be able to perform the defensive duties. Um, and I suppose the question to the people watching would be, what would this be to you? What would the question marks be and why? based on how you want to play um, and the current players that you have. Um, so this really is, is a method that, that we use to, to unpick that. Um, and as you can see there, there's a number of larger factors that sit around the outside, such as intercepting the ball to regain. So intercepting the ball to regain, first of all, what, what do we mean by that? How do we get a shared understanding between myself, other coaches and the player around what that actually means? So if you... Um, look at the next slide it's then starting to break that down so the definition of what that actually means and the players then having a, an understanding of that and i suppose what then becomes really important is the underpinning detail so you know how do we break that down so we talk about intercepting we don't just mean on the floor we're at various heights um at different surfaces and then actually what do we utilize the interception for um, so is it, you know, is it to clear, is it to then attack and create an attack? Um, do we then keep it to regain? Um, and then, as I said before, then the use of the body to compete. So all the body and limbs again, how do we utilize our body effectively to compete in these 1v1 duels? Um, so all those that underpinning detail allows the player to be really clear around what you're going after. And for you as a coach to be really clear around what are we developing the players for and, and where are they currently at what's their ability and then what would we like their capabilities to be and how do we bridge the gap through practice um, and through the, the sessions that i ultimately put on as a coach okay do you want to take us through this piece here so yeah. again just the example and recognizing the pressing triggers so we, we had two two headlines on that on the slide with marcus rashford on the front mm -hmm. um just talk us through how we go to like layer one, the definition, and then under to the underpinning detail. Yeah, so again, this this follows a, a similar, similar to the structure really around recognising the pressing triggers. What does that actually mean? So how do we define that between myself, coaches, other coaching staff, player, so that we're really clear on what it is we're going after? And then the underpinning detail. Um, so the, the triggers itself, backwards, square, and slow passes, um, press loose balls on poor touches, um, recognise when players are facing their own goal and prevent the turn um, and leads. I think that's really an, an important point that, that probably hits a different um, corner as well as the tech and tack is around leading um, and actually being really clear and, and we didn't mention this earlier on in the four corners but in terms of the social aspects as well of how that that first action and how you recognise and ultimately go towards action for that first trigger will have a, an effect on the players around you, whether that's the second presser or whether that's a unit behind you or whether that's the back line. So it's been really clear around my actions will then affect the next action that's going to happen. So I've got to be really clear about where I'm going, who I'm going to um, and why I'm going. Uh, how much of this detail would you reveal to the player, Kelsey? I think this would depend on, on where the player currently is in their journey and, and being able to chunk this learning up. And I think this is what's great about having something like this, is that this is a almost a menu of learning where we're saying, right, where are the players at now? What can they currently do? What can my nine currently do in particular around the high press and around this topic? And where are the gaps? Where are the skills gaps? And where what do I need to expose them more to? Um, and, and exposing them at the right time for their for their age and stage of development, um, but also where they currently are in that journey. So if if they can currently do two out of the four, what comes next? Why? And that might be down to the game model um, and how you like to play, but also it might be down to being a, a natural progression from the last learning chunk that you did. Yeah, and I suppose that ultimately this would lead us down our practice design route, which we're going to look at in a little little while. 
going to ask Warren to to just look at the similar cards for for the wide forward. Yeah, so I'm just going to go through the same format as Kels um, for a wide player. So again, looking at defending 1v1 to regain. So from a technical aspect, you know, again, looking at breaking it down uh, 1v1 to regain. So again, then being, I suppose, aware and looking at triggers as to when they can go and regain it and obviously what they do with it going forward. Um, so you're looking at the technique to tackle, to intercept cleanly at the right time. And at the right time is essential because if they don't do that at the right time, potentially they can get beat quite easily. Um, and then obviously the opposition of attacking our goal. So we look at, you know, front foot front foot tackles to nick, uh, back foot tackles to block. I mean, certainly with back, back, um, sorry, back foot tackles to block, you know, and as I just mentioned, they initially have gone for the ball, they've missed it, um, but they're willing to show a desire to get back in and win the ball from when it's beyond them, um, which is quite essential for our defensive strategy. Uh, stepping in front to intercept. So again, they're reading the pass that's potentially being played to a fullback or centre-back. They're ready to jump on it to go and attack. Uh, to win the ball clean and retain possession. And again, I mean, I think you, when you look at winning the ball, essentially you just want to win the ball. You, you, know, you want to stop the opposition from progressing. But ultimately, if you can win that and keep possession, then again, there's, there potentially could be a goal-scoring opportunity at the end of that. Um, uses of body, uh, using your body to, uh, to win physical contact against the opposition. Um, so again, it might just be, you know, you're, you're pressing that the defender's got his back uh, to play, you're forcing him back towards his own goal, but knowing how to use your body to sort of pin him and force him going one way without failing him. Uh, for the second that he may open up, that we can use our body or our arms or our shoulder to go and win the ball back. So that's quite essential. So I think really is that you're looking at making sure they've got enough opportunity in training uh, to be able to to action these things. Um, because ultimately, if you, if you want them to be good in the game, they need to have lots of repetition in training to be able to do that. So practice design, again, is essential. I think this, um, just before you move on to, yeah. to, to the next one, Warren, I think there's a good good opportunity here to say to coaches that what the examples that we're seeing here really are only, only surface scratching detail. Um, if you wouldn't mind just going back one slide um, for me. So... Stepping in front to intercept, if we took that as an example and, and, and we put that to the top of the page and said, right, how do we build detail from that? that there's several several practice sessions in their own right, just, just in how to step in front, when to step in front, when you know, where do you, where are you to start with, when do you know the ball is going to the player, when do you gamble, yeah. blah, 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 all that kind of thing. So there, there's other layers below this and it would be good – Good practice, I think, for coaches to look at this and go, this is a quite a good way to sort of test myself. How much information can I add to front foot tackles to Nick, for example? How much more information? Could I put another line of, or another layer, rather, of detail below that? And, okay. and before you know where you are, sorry sorry to uh, interrupt you there, Warren, just wanted to say, that, to finish off, before you know where you are, you've, you've, you've composed yourself quite a volume of work and, and, and knowledge and detail. Yeah, and I think it's essential, uh, Ted, you know, in your practice design, say, for instance, you're looking at, um, you know, tackles to win the ball and to nick in front. I mean, you're looking at, you know, when to mark space, when to mark the player. Uh, you want the pitch to be big enough to, to cause those uh, issues for the player as such. So, again, if your practice design isn't right, you may not get the opportunity to be able to do that. Yeah, and, I th you know, we're, we're constantly being asked uh, by learners about detail and we're constantly reminding learners uh, also that, that they need more detail around their work. And, and this is one way of, uh, you know, having a go at it and recording what you know. And if you've got the system right, you can just keep adding. Once you once you pick up a piece of information, you add it in. Yeah. And uh, before you know where you are, you've, you've like I said earlier, you've got quite a volume of work there. And, and when you put it all together, it, it becomes, you know, quite quite staggering that the amount of information that, that is there to access, I suppose. Yeah. And it doesn't happen overnight, Ted. It takes a you know it takes a long period of time to to be able to drip feed all this information into your players. But ultimately, yeah. it's a development program, isn't it? So that when you know the end goal is that they're potentially capable of doing all these things, uh, they may not be able to do all of them 100 percent effectively, but they still have a good understanding and they'll have a desire to want to do it. It's a good visual aid as well for players, isn't it? If you're doing a session on defending, you know, one v one defending with a purpose to regain. Um, the production of a little card, a little reminder card 
to the player, you know, this is the stuff we're going to go after in this practice. These are the key things. There's not a lot of detail on the card itself, but the essential headlines are there, which should act as reminders to the players about the detail that they've looked at in the past yeah. uh, and what you're going to visit uh, during the session. Yeah. That's really good. Thanks for that. Some, some great insight there into, into to the way uh, we work there. I'm going to look, look again at another video, um, which we link to uh, you know, how the game looks. What does it look like within the game, this detail and this, this stuff is. So we're just going to sit back and watch this for, for a few minutes and, and then we'll ask Kelsey and Warren uh, to comment uh, on this. Thanks. Kelsey, I know you wanted to say something about um, Ready and the way they worked on this one. Yeah, so you could you could see there um, just just as the the ball got transferred across, it, there was a transition. So when we speak about right at the beginning, the moments of the game that the high press happens, and what does that actually look like? Um, there was a transition that occurred, and the the wide right player in this instance was was out of out of shape and as you could see there from the first press from the nine that the example of that that breaking strength and, and has overran it slightly but with due to the numbers around the ball um and the aggressive nature of reading they they then go to a, to attack it again um and they continue to do so until they force it into into a wide area where they just continue the press so this is now over larger distances that we spoke about and players then backing up in the next units for the intercept so again, uh, the bodies, again, the body and limbs, utilizing body, body contact, being physical, and then the interception of the ball again. Yeah, we're just going to go back a little bit to the um, to, to some of the Man City uh, Liverpool footage because I know Warren's got some things he wanted to comment on, on some of the stuff around this these clips. Yeah, so if we can just look at just look at Liverpool, just when when watching this now, consider Liverpool's front three, um, consider the split positions between the midfield three behind that, and obviously link that into where their back four position themselves. So if we let it, if we let it run to the end of the clip, then I'll sort of speak around it. So again, in general, Liverpool are kind of staying quite narrow. And they're wanting Man City. Man City are looking to penetrate through the middle of Liverpool. Liverpool want them to go beyond. So if you, sorry, if you can, if you can go back to that clip again for me, if you don't mind. So again, they hold it there. So again, so that's Liverpool's midfield looking to go in central to go and put pressure on the ball. But ultimately, what the front three are looking to do. Is to isolate the uh, the two centre backs and then, and a number four and the goalkeeper. Any ball that goes over the top to the wide fullbacks, uh, Zinchenko and uh, Walker, the midfield uh, two wider midfield players are going to look to jump on them. Um, so that's kind of Liverpool's strategy around that. So City are very effective at playing through you, uh, and if allowed to, they can you know they're comfortable with progressing at the pitch quite quickly. 
But ultimately, with that, the chance would be that if you don't get your press right, as you just see before, and the ball can literally go straight beyond you uh, into your back into your back line and potentially go on. Uh, so you know the distances between each individual player and units are essential. When you're looking at a job and a half for some of these players, certainly Henderson and Wijnaldum, they're looking at a job and a half at least to try and put themselves in positions where they can be effective. So again, the back four being prepared to get in a foot race and be ahead of the ball to win the ball back. And then this is the same Reading clip again, so you can see it through and just overruns it there. Ability to be able to, to stop and start in shorter distances and then continue this over longer distances. And you can see the job and a half again from the midfielders. So they're on the press. And if you watch Rachel Finesse again, who's just, just on the tackle, doing a job and a half here just to intercept now down the channel to then regain. Thanks for that. So we're gonna we're gonna take some time to see how this impacts on on practice design and how we might bring some of this work to the coaching pitch and, and look at certain aspects in particular. I'm, I'm going to use um, the footage or a piece of footage from the Man City Liverpool game at Wembley just to just to sort of put together an example of of what this might look like. So as we're thinking about the work we're going to do, um, we're using footage from game to give us give us as real a picture as we can possibly get. And we'll see in a moment, once, uh, once this footage plays through, we'll use a screenshot of a moment, um, which we'll use as the basis for our work. So we can see here um, the three key focus players, the 11, the 7 and the 9, which and we've already spoken at length about those and and Warren went into some detail there. But we can see a total of six Liverpool players in the clip. And we can see uh, eight or nine Man City players. There's going to be nine in the practice. Uh, just below the bottom right-hand corner, there, there's another player. We're going to take this to um, the next slide. And I've, uh, you know, I, I'm not going to apologise to Aaron. I'm going to thank Aaron Danks for for giving me the brain to grass idea. I really like that, uh, and that's something that um, features quite strongly now in in my thinking when I'm trying to translate what I'm seeing on the on you know in real time on the grass to what I want to see um, in a practice. So on the top picture there, it's the same as you can see, same screenshot, but we're going to identify the key Liverpool players in the practice. So there's going to be six of them in our practice and 
down below, there's going to be nine Manchester City players. As you can see, I've included Bernardo Silva, who you can't quite see in shot at the moment. Um, and that's due to the camera angle, really. It's made it quite difficult for us to capture it. Uh, if we could see it from behind the goal, then he would, you could clearly see that he was uh, an integral player in the practice. So what does this look like in our 2D version? So we need to put the plain air in first. And, and I thought if we had a target zone, so this is, this is asking the Manchester City players, can you play out from the back the way you want to? And can you progress with controlled possession into that yellow zone? And can you also, as maybe as a bonus, pass the ball into the base of the mannequin and actually hit the mannequin uh, with more accuracy um, for some additional points to the practice? Although that's not the focus, but by giving the opposition a focus, it helps you to um, challenge the players you want to work with. So there's our, there's our back six for Manchester City. And there's our Liverpool three. And... I think what we have to remember is this is not not me designing a practice around how I want it set up. This is me looking at the at the moment in the game and the reality of the moment in the game and trying to bring that to life on the tactics board. So we've got a 6v3 there in favour of Manchester City. And then in the yellow zone, we've got an additional three Manchester City players and three Liverpool players. So there's the six. It's a 6v9, which is split into two uh, two smaller games, if you like, a 6v3 and a 3v3. I've then taken that to uh, the, the next piece where we talk about um, what I call 10 key session constructs. Now, the, the number 10 is quite arbitrary. Um, it doesn't need to be 10. It can be 8, can be 3, can be 6, can be whatever you want it to be. But in my world, I, I, I found that 10 worked well for me in this particular instance. So we've got our basic design there, and then we've got some as you can see, number one, it's talking about the players remaining locked in to start with. Uh, and, and for me, the key thing is something that you don't often see, particularly with uh, less experienced coaches, is um, the transition at the beginning of the, beginning of the game. So we, we want to press. So I'm going to give the ball to Reds to start with, to a red player in the, in the end zone, either Henderson, Fabinho or Wijnaldum. And I'm going to ask them to play a through ball through the back line of Manchester City's defence, and then we're going to play from that moment. Um, so the closest blue would get the ball, would intercept it, and begin play with a back pass to Bravo, and then then we're we're up and running from that moment. <clears throat> There's the additional uh, constructs for the session. You notice that the three front players from Liverpool remain narrow, so when the ball does go to Walker or does go to Zinchenko, as, as Warren quite rightly pointed out before. They're dealt with by Henderson and Wijnaldum, respectively. And the question I ask myself at this moment is, who's actually in control of this of this work? Is it the team in possession, or is it the team out of possession, allowing certain things to happen, and then when it looks like progress, progress is going to be made, they change their, their, their body language, and they change the way they work, they up the tempo, to try and stop that ball going forwards. And so the session would go on. Um, we'd deliver it over a period of time. Something something quite interesting did happen when I watched the footage. And it, it was a, around City's, uh, the time City were in uh, possession. They played the ball around several times at the back. Then all of a sudden, David Silva appeared, moved into that back zone and created a 7v3. It was almost like David was saying, well, enough's enough now. We need to go forward. So he, he went and joined in, made that extra player. That that drew in um, a Liverpool midfield player. So it now went to 7v4. But that also then opened up opportunities for Man City to play through them. And if not through, then over uh, to, to uh, advance up the field. So we would look at that. And certainly from Liverpool point of view and from the pressing point of view, we would think about things like that and, and take that into account. So then I had some coaching aims. What were the things I thought um, I could work on with the red players? It would be things like, so reaction to transition, pressing triggers, supporting the press, the role of the first engager. Uh, how do we set the trap? How do we force play? Uh, how do we control what's going on? 
And the, the, the last one for me, I think, is a real important one. The menu of success, ultimate success, would be regaining possession, obviously. Um, but there are other smaller successes that can be gained, which collectively uh, can be ro really rewarding uh, for the team and the players. And as we mentioned earlier before, when we're looking at the four-corner profile, uh, we're talking about that willingness and desire to work hard. If they're constantly being rewarded, um, then I think that helps uh, massively towards persuading players that it's a worthwhile thing to do. The final thing, again, I, I, I'm uh, uh, indebted to uh, Aaron Danks for this. Um, this controlling the practice to start with and, and developing towards a more chaotic uh, end point around practice design. Um, whilst it's something I've always done, I'd never, I'd never thought of it in... In, in visually in the in the way in which Aaron presented it, so I thank him for that. And um, I'm interested now to go to uh, back to Warren and Kelsey just for their some so, some ideas from from peers, if you like, from from coaching peers as to where they might see some some issues around the practice, or they might see some strengths around the practice. Either or, I don't mind. This mm -hmm. is a this is an open forum. Tim, Tim, I think probably a question, sorry, sorry. sorry, a question yeah. from me was going to be around. Um, and I was spoke about earlier in the webinar around those anticipated actions, what we we're expecting Man City to do based on what we've seen yeah. um, versus, you know, what happens for them to solve that performance problem at that moment in time. They might come up with something completely different. So how do you get in the, the performance problems that the players might experience and, and get in a variety of what ifs, if you like, from yeah. that controlled through to chaotic environment? Okay. So those what ifs would be, so it, the control bit at the beginning would mean that I would control what Man City's back six are doing. I control David Silva. I don't let David Silva go in on a whim. That's under my control. As I shift across that yellow arrow at the bottom, I might then say to Silva, okay, you can go in, you can go in if you want. Um, but to be fair to the Reds, if you go in, I've got to allow one of them to go in. Um, but the Reds might be going in thinking, oh, it's an attempt to balance up the numbers when actually that's what Man City want. They want a red to go in because it's going to disrupt the press and open up avenues to, to play forward. So it's, we, but once we get into that chaotic state, that's when we can look at that and say, is that something you really need to do? If David Silva goes in to make a seventh player in the back third, is that really, is that really that, that destructive? And because at the moment, I think Liverpool are controlling play what they're not getting are too many opportunities to actually go and get the ball. But what they are doing is the first engager is going out, just making sure that it's not being played forward. And if it is is played forward, say to Walker or Zinchenko or to Rodri, then a midfield player is jumping on that quite quickly to, to force that back again. Um, sometimes, Kelsey, there's the, the, you know, you can predict as much as, as you want, but you've got to let it roll and, and, and let the practice unfold before you can, you know that something's bound to crop up in the practice that you haven't, you haven't second thought, and and, and then you've got to deal with it on the fly. Well, on you, were, you were gonna. Yeah, sorry, Ted. Just to add, I just looking at the practice. I mean, the first thing that jumps out to me is obviously the numbers. You know, there's a nine versus six, obviously with the goalkeeper involved as well. Yeah. I know you it zoned off into two zones, but my biggest concern is going to be, you know, certainly fatigue for the players during this practice, especially. Henderson and Wijnaldum, who are going to be expected to do the most running. Yep. Uh, because with the front three playing quite narrow, they've got a you know, reasonably easy job in respect of the three, um, you know, the five, the 30 and the 16 to deal with. Because yep. the second ball goes out to the fullbacks in a high position, Henderson and Wijnaldum are going to jump. So, you know, certainly working, if you're going to do a practice like this, you know, consider the players in the practice um, and the energies that they're going to, you know, go through to try and, you know, to be successful at winning the ball back especially yeah. in wide areas. Yeah. And I think I, I, if I uh, sort of reference point number 10 of my key session constructs, it talks about delivering the session in a series of timed periods. Mm. So exactly with that in mind, um, there will be a huge impact on the physicality of the work. So yeah. we need to make sure that we build in natural breaks, that we don't play for too long in, in one go. Although yeah. by the end, by the time we get to chaos, I, I will be wanting that. Um, so that the players are stressed a little bit, you know, if they make a wrong decision yeah. and they they're opened up by the opposition, then that, that, that's what we want to see. I can get it back. 
And, and I'll, talk, I'll talk about, sorry, final thing, I'll talk about that directed to guided. So I, I personally like to be quite dominant at the early part of a, of a piece of work. And then I try to sort of withdraw into the shadows as the work unfolds. I try to be, uh, have a dominance without being dominant at yeah. the end of the end of the work. Yeah. And I just think the switch of play as well is a concern. Um, I mean, the, the quicker City move the ball around the pitch, the harder potentially it will be for Henderson and Ronaldo to be able to get and jump out onto the to the fullbacks. So yeah. it's essential that there's a balance behind the front three. Um, and, you, you know, you're five and you're 14, Ronaldo and Henderson. Don't drift too far across that sort of middle point of the pitch because no. that ball is always going to be an outlet for City. Yeah, and, and you know, the, uh, my, my sort of, if I was in a court of law, I would stand up and say, at the end of the day, my lord, um, this picture is taken from a real picture in the game on a big pitch at Wembley. Um, you're quite right to point out all those issues, but that's the way Liverpool set, out, set yeah. up uh, at that particular moment. Now, obviously, what's not available is, is Liverpool's back four. So when, when Henderson does go in, what happens behind him? We, we, you know, we weren't looking at that. We can't look at everything uh, in, in one go. Um, so I take that on board. And I, I suppose if I was to put a percentage on on that yellow arrow at the bottom, the reality, and if it was, you know, intended coaching style and brain to grass, how real would it be? Probably 90% plus, but certainly not 100%. Yeah. And I think finally, Ted, just to add to that, I think the biggest, you know, the reward for the Reds winning the ball back potentially I mean, they could obviously get off and try and finish, but ultimately, could the session then start back with them having the ball? Um, Absolutely. To play yeah. through. Because as yes. you know, you want to be able to keep them engaged because ultimately it's a chasing session for them, or it could yes. be. And, and that's what that's where this chaotic bit hasn't, you know, we can't look at that at this stage. The, the, the point of the practice, if Liverpool do win it back and then try to score, they're going to be disrupted in terms of their defensive shape because they're now trying to apply the attacking principles of play um, should they then lose it again, now they're a little bit unbalanced and, and out of shape and they've got to try and get back into shape. So, but, but by the time they get to that stage, and, you know, this is obviously a fictitious practice. It's never going to happen in my world. Um, not, not with players of this quality anyway. Um, you, could, you could imagine how chaotic that might look uh, and how much work you might have to do there. It looks all neat and tidy when you've got those names on the board. But... Um, the reality is it would look very different uh, in, in my world. Brilliant. Okay. If there's anything else you'd like to say, guys, no, as we're coming to the, uh, we're coming to the closing part of the workshop now. Um, I just like to say thanks very much for you, for your contribution. I think it's been uh, very insightful uh, great to get two, uh, two different contrasting aspects, national teams from Warren, female game from Kelsey, particularly your, your insight into Reading and Arsenal in particular. I think that, that was absolutely uh, first class. So thank you very much, uh, you two. Thank you, Matty, in the background for the, the technical support and to Matt Bishop, who's been overseeing us. And most of all, thank you to everybody who's taken the time and trouble to listen in. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Cheers, Cheers. Cheers.